women's movement in South Australia began with the struggle for women's suffrage, that is, the right of women to vote. Campaigners such as Mary Lee and Elizabeth Webb Nichols and groups such as the Women's Suffrage League did not see gaining the right to vote as an end in itself, but rather as a necessary step in tackling the prevailing double standard that worked against the well-being of women and children and indeed of society more generally. So what exactly were these double standards? In 19th century South Australia, white women were legally bound to their fathers until they married and then to their husbands. Women had no rights over their own bodies. Prevailing ideas about marital rights meant that men had sexual access to their wives' bodies regardless of whether or not women consented. In fact, it was possible for a man to divorce his wife because she denied him conjugal rights, but it was not possible for a woman to divorce her husband because he forced her to have marital relations. At the same time, until 1885, the age of consent for girls was 12 years old, making them extremely vulnerable to exploitation. Corporal punishment of a woman by her husband, what today we would call domestic violence, was legal and was widely regarded as a necessary evil. Prior to the passing of the Married Women's Property Act in 1883, everything a white woman owned became her husband's upon marriage. If she was in paid employment, even her wages belonged to him. Women also had no rights over their children who were the legal property of their fathers. It was not until the introduction of the Guardianship of Infants Act in 1940 that both parents had equal custody rights. You may wonder why, given these double standards, more women of the period did not choose to remain single. One reason, and perhaps the, the main reason, is that this was a luxury most women literally could not afford. In South Australia in the late 19th century, significant numbers of women were in paid employment, but they were denied access to many professions and were largely unable to earn a living wage. This was further entrenched by the Harvester Judgment of 1907, which, while securing a living wage for most, but not all men, justified wages that were much lower for women workers, since women workers were assumed not to be the heads of households, even though in many cases, of course, they were. Women's suffrage was raised in seven separate but unsuccessful bills in the South Australian Parliament between 1886 and 1894. The hard-won right of women to vote and to stand for Parliament was finally signed into law by Queen Victoria on the 2nd of February, 1895. And it was a right that was afforded to Aboriginal women and white women alike. That historic moment made South Australia the first colony in Australia and among one of the first places in the world to grant women these rights. But both before and since, Women and the many organisations they formed have fought for legal and social changes that would improve the lives of all. For example, in the first half of the 20th century, the women's movement played a central role in, amongst other things, the introduction of maternity allowance and child endowment, the establishment of maternal and child welfare services, the amendment of the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1918, which gave women equal access with men to the single ground of adultery for the dissolution of marriage, and the passing of the Testators Family Maintenance Act of 1918, which ensured that adequate provision for wives and children was made by their husbands in their will. In the second half of the 20th century, the women's movement rigorously campaigned for women's liberation. Ideas became more radical and protests more rowdy. Women activists demanded equal pay, access to contraception and abortion, the outlawing of domestic violence and rape in marriage, acknowledgement of sexual assault and harassment, and an end to victim blaming. 
The Adelaide Women's Liberation Movement was established at the University of Adelaide in 1968 by women who were frustrated by the male domination they experienced in the labour and anti-war movements. The group published a Women's Liberation Manifesto and in 1973 opened the Women's Liberation Centre at Bloor House. The group also played an active role in establishing women's health centres, the Adelaide Rape Crisis Centre, the Working Women's Centre, a Women's Studies Resource Centre and Women's Studies programs at Adelaide and Flinders Universities. That same year, 1973, Australia's first Reclaim the Night marches took place. Hundreds of women marched to protest against male violence. More recently, the Me Too movement has campaigned against the sexual assault of women and has used social media to graphically demonstrate just how ubiquitous this crime continues to be. Contemporary activism has also challenged the assumptions of two separate and distinct genders and call for the recognition of transgender and non-binary people and their rights. The women's movement has never been a singular unified entity. Instead, the term loosely brings together groups and individuals whose ideals, affiliations and activism have varied considerably. Women from different geographic locations, different historic moments, races, religions, classes and so on, have held very different and sometimes conflicting views. But what unites them, at least at a fundamental level, is their focus on women. So many of the rights and freedoms we take for granted today were achieved by those involved in the women's movement. There is, of course, still much to be achieved and the role of activists and of women's and feminist organisations is no less important today than it was in the early days of the colony.